Afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Wilkes. I'm a director at uh, Pori Management Consulting, and I'm responsible for the networks and smart energy activities at Pori. Um, my personal involvement in energy storage goes back mm, 10 years, um, and I've worked with a number of different developers and investors, and indeed, on occasion, the odd policymaker in relation to storage. And I've been asked to talk about can we leave storage to the market? Um, I'll skip past the advert other than to say that uh, we are a specialist energy consultancy and we work across Europe and this is one of our uh, main areas of focus at the moment. So I was asked this basic question and this is the answer. Um, basically, there is absolutely no reason why storage couldn't be left to the market, but at present it can't. And I'll go into some reasons as to why that's the case. So a little bit of a refresher, um, some people in the room will have seen some of these before, but a little bit of a refresher, why, why are we talking about flexibility, why is it important, where does storage fit into this jigsaw, what are the potential opportunities for energy storage and what are the challenges that storage faces and then some final conclusions. So most of us will have seen charts like this in, in different places, but basically what we're seeing is an unprecedented growth in renewable generation technology, principally wind-driven in this country, but elsewhere solar technology. And as been discussed ad nauseum, this is not controllable technology in, in the sense that we're used to in the good old days of coal and gas. And that presents new and interesting challenges across the whole value chain. Um, and um, this is why we're now talking about flexibility. Um, Flexibility as we go forward um, very much is increasing. Um, the need for that flexibility is increasing, sorry. And that need at shorter and shorter time frames is going to get more and more as we go forward with this higher penetration of renewables and intermittency that um, can change behavior in relatively short time frames um, and has consequences on the networks and indeed the other generators on the system. So um, we all know that uh, storage is not the only game in town when it comes to flexibility. That's been pointed out to us very clearly this morning. Um, there are basically four different ways that you can address flexibility. You can have flexible generation, a little bit carbon intensive, but hey. You can have interconnection. Now that works at scale and can solve some issues, but can you rely on your neighbors in all situations? You can have demand side response. Um, and that can work in a number of different ways. Um, but I wonder how many of you in this room would be willing to respond day in, day out to price signals. And then we have electricity storage. And of, of these four options, storage is the most diverse, both in terms of scale, in terms of technology, in terms of services. So in theory, it has an awful lot to offer in this brave new world of decarbonized energy. And this just makes the point. There are all the various technologies. We've heard about pumped hydro this morning, which is the most mature large-scale technology. But there's batteries, there's flywheels, there's geothermal, there's liquid air, there's compressed air storage. You could go on and on and on. All at different levels of maturity and all have different technical characteristics which suit different um, potential opportunities in the market, which I'll come on to. One of the things that we can say about storage as a, as a, as a general sweeping statement is because it's in many areas still an emerging technology, certainly at scale, it's relatively expensive to the good old OCGT or some of the more conventional technologies that we know and love and like to use. However, Storage can be used for all kinds of purposes. We've heard a little bit this morning about the ancillary services dimension. We've heard a little bit about network benefits. We've heard a little bit about wholesale benefits. We've heard a little bit about generation benefits. The point is that you can put all these together. Um, so in theory, a storage device and different storage devices will target different pots of the, the revenue opportunity more so than others can try to access revenues from a number of different revenue streams. I mean, traditionally, in the short term, people have targeted the ancillary services market because it's the most 
accessible in many ways, it's the most well defined in many ways. I'm still trying to work out what the capacity mechanism is going to do, um, and maybe we'll find out in three or four months' time. Um, but the fundamental point, and this is my key slide really, is that the economics of storage as we stand here today rely on the ability to easily access a number of different revenue streams, pancakes of value if you like, and this is an example of how a particular value proposition for a particular storage plant um, might stack up. Against that you've got the cost of the technology. Now if you can access all these revenue streams, then the thing works, it flies. However, as we stand today, a number of these benefits, let's call it infrastructure avoidance, for example, are not easily accessible. They're not something that the storage developer can readily tap into. Take that bit away and suddenly the picture looks a lot more <laughs> pessimistic, shall we say. Now this will vary from technology to technology and, te and circumstance to circumstance, but this is the fundamental challenge. Because going forward, what we obviously need to do with storage is to improve the economics versus alternative options. We need to make sure the revenue streams are accessible and deliverable to the investors in the storage. Um, because when we look to the longer term, we're not going to just be able to rely on OCGTs. We're not going to just be able to rely on demand side response. We're not going to be able to just rely on interconnection. We're going to need all four of these different deliverers of flexibility and we're going to need them at scale and if you want all four of these technologies to be in place in the long term then you've got to make sure that there's a, a development pathway for the various providers of flexibility to make sure that it can be there at scale and it can be there economically so a little bit of investment now delivers a big benefit in the long term Now, lots of these revenue streams, as we see today, are dependent on policy decisions, and it's no, you know, it's no um, surprise that much of the morning was dominated by policymakers and policy speakers. And what struck me from the, the part of the debate that um, I experienced was that, and this is, I think, the general experience of the storage community, is you go along to various policymakers and you get this. I'm looking at this piece of the jigsaw, don't talk to me about the rest of it. This is what I'm interested in. If this works, if you work in this little silo, great. If you don't, sorry. It's almost like, you know, think of storage as a rugby ball. You throw it out to the opposition. There's lots of players, lots of different players. May not have played together before. Certainly some of them don't like each other. And they get the ball, and one goes, oh, that's not for me. And they throw it to the next one, and they throw it to the next one, and then at the end it gets thrown off the pitch. And it's extremely frustrating because you don't feel like you're moving forward. So I think the debate that was, you know, was tried to be triggered at the end is a very valid one. How do we make sure that we get away from individuals thinking about blinkered positions, recognizing that storage is unique, it's not generation. Anyone who says that and believes it can leave the room now. Um, and it relies on a different... <coughs> stack of revenue streams to any other player in the energy market and it's particularly exposed to the ability to access multiple revenue streams. If you can't make that work it's a real real challenge. And we talk about the smart grid and everything will change um, and it's going to have to change um, whether we like it or not. Demand side technologies, electric vehicles whenever they show up, electric heating, more solar, all these things change fundamentally the architecture of the energy sector and the way it operates. And it's still the situation that we're trying to regulate it the way it's always been. And I think one of the challenges that we see is that, as we've discussed this morning, storage can hit each of the elements of the value chain. It's not just in one element of the value chain, but at the moment it's not recognized in its own right. And there's no joined up thinking to allow to get the big picture together. Another example this morning, I think we've talked about <coughs> the, the ability of the networks to own, own storage and whether um, you know, selling energy onto the market was a contravention. And there is the project going on at the moment, which I'm sure Peter talked about earlier with UKPN, looking at how can we make storage work within a DNO context 
but by enabling that, de that storage device to access other revenue streams and what are the regulatory barriers and commercial barriers to that. And hopefully that will feed in um, and evolve the way that uh, Ofgem are thinking about this in a, in a broader perspective, not just in a I'm only worried about the distribution network perspective. Because the only way that project works is if it's able to access those revenues and it's able to, you know, uh, to stack those up against the benefits that it's providing um, at a network level, which might not in its own right justify that device. So you've got to look at the bigger picture. We've talked about capacity mechanisms this morning. Um, I, there's a lot of detail there. Um, fundamentally, there are two points for me. One is that storage is lumped in with DSR. Yes, there are similar characteristics, but it's not the same. Um, anyone, you know, anyone that hasn't really thought about the fact that storage can't run forever <laughs> needs to uh, <laughs> needs to go look again. Um, the other point about the capacity mechanism is it may um, it may dampen the wholesale differentials. So if you're looking to you know, benefit from the wholesale market, in theory, if you're reallocating some of the money to the capacity, then that's going to come out of the energy payment. Otherwise, we're putting prices up, aren't we, for no benefit. So there must be a bit of a trade-off going on there. The way the capacity mechanism is designed, it's trying in a way, I think, to value flexibility, but it's ultimately not clear how, how effectively that's going to work. But we do know, and I'm sure Phil talked about it earlier, there is this growing need for, for flexibility in terms of the ancillary services and the balancing services. There's an <coughs> interesting debate about whether that should be at a transmission level or a distribution level or altogether. But the need is there. Um, so how do you make sure the supply is there? Because, you know, again, rational economic theory, if you introduce new capacity payments into the mechanism, um, then it is quite possible that incumbent players don't feel the need to recover all the costs that new entrants need to recover to be able to play in the market. Um, it's very difficult to see a new Dinorweg. It costs an awful lot to, to tunnel your way through uh, for 2,000 megawatts of pump storage, that's for sure. Um, and so they have an incumbent advantage. Um, there's no doubt they have an incumbent advantage, just as any other flexible technology on the system has. But we're in a world where we need new investment. We need new entrants. So you've got to provide a way of encouraging that to come onto the system. So just to round up, um, first of all, storage is not just one thing. It's a variety of technologies, a variety of scales that can provide a variety of different services. It's complex. It can access a number of different revenues, and it actually needs to access a number of different revenues to make the economics really, really work. It is an emerging technology. It's a sweeping statement, I know. Some are more advanced than others. But in general, there is still the cost maturation process to go through as the technology <coughs> matures, as the scale of deployment increases. Um, so in the longer term, you know, if the regulations evolve and the markets evolve in the right way, in theory, yes, the market should be... <coughs> a perfectly suitable place for storage to play alongside demand side, generation, whoever wants to play in that particular market. But in the short term, we have to recognise it's not quite so simple. And just as we've thrown money at wind to reduce the cost, and just as we've thrown money at CCS to get that going, and just as we've thrown money at other solutions for flexibility, maybe there's a little, little, you know, just some loose change lying around that we could spare for storage to just give it, give that push to get the momentum so that when we really need it as parts of the, of the flexibility mix, and we don't need it at 10 or 15 megawatts, but we need it at 2 or 3 gigawatts, we have it there. Because if it's not economic at that point, you really will be asking the consumers to pay an awful lot of money. So on that note, I will finish my rant. <laughs>